Hello, and welcome to episode nine of the Noise Blast Hour, sponsored by Noise Engineering. I am your guest host and doer of many things here at Noise Engineering, Chris Kaiser. Today, we have a very special episode. We have first a performance by I Am Eve, followed by an interview with Tiff Randall of I Am Eve, and then we have a performance by Orfix, followed by an interview with Rich Adi and Chris, Christina Seely, or Christy Seely, from Orfix. These are going to be two really fantastic performances. I cannot wait for you to see them. So without any further ado, uh, we'll start off with I Am Eve.
I'm here with Tiff Randall from I Am Eve. Um, I met Tiff uh, fairly recently when I did a short workshop uh, along with Tori Letzler to the Association for Women Film Composers. And Tiff got really excited about getting into modular and uh, we've been in touch ever since. So um, I'm really excited to have Tiff here today. Thank you so much, Tiff. That was amazing. Um, first question I always like to ask is, tell us a bit about your set. Sure. Um, well, I'm running my set in Ableton Live. Um, everything that you saw was, uh, was almost entirely looped. Um, it's like a few little things that have been, um, you know, pre-established in the set, but um, everything is live performed, live looped. Um, it's it's actually been the hardest <laughs> set I've ever put together. Um, I've been working with a friend of mine in Germany who's uh, who does this coding with this program called Clipix Pro. So he's been teaching me how to how to um, live loop in that as well as code in it. Um, and uh, you know, the, I think the interesting challenge is that two of the three songs um, were songs that I've 
were produced, already finished, so they're getting ready to release them. And so the, a lot of the challenge with, with uh, trying to figure out how to perform those songs in this kind of setting where everything is live looped, live performed, um, was trying to figure out how to break down all of the elements um, and actually play them live. Um, you know, I have uh, I have a couple. I don't know if you can see them, but um, I have the sense of morph here and uh, just a couple MIDI controllers, my profit and um, my push. Um, that's mostly what I'm using a Roland BT3 on my vocals. Um, but yeah, all the parts are, are live um, and all of it had to be prearranged um, so that I'm like hitting all of my marks in Ableton. Um, it's very tricky um, and a lot of fun. I mean, I've been basically trying to re, uh, reconceive how to perform live ever since we've been in this pandemic because I'm not playing live with other people. Um, and I was just getting, uh, a little bored with the way I was performing before. So this uh, this way of doing it's a big challenge and it's just fun. Um, it's nice to be able to like throw down all the parts and um, yeah. Um, the other song that I did in a set, um, calling it Oceans for now, I don't know the title for it yet, but I put that together uh, for this set um, and uh, I just really wanted to showcase the sound that I made with my new modular setup. Thank you for helping me that together. Um, I just, you know, absolutely fell in love with the sound that I designed. And so I just built a whole track around that. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it's really fun. Love Very cool. I love, I love this module. It's so great. I feel like I missed, um, I've been missing this my, my entire musical life. <laughs> so, <laughs> so grateful to be starting to deep dive into that. It's just, it's just the sounds are just not, you can't even compare it to all of the stuff, and, you know, all of the software sense. I mean, even though there's amazing software sense, it's, it's untouchable. Nice. Well, um, I guess I'll jump ahead on my list of questions. And since you're talking about your new modular setup, what, what made you take the dive into modular? Um, you know, I, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to, to dive more into um, sound design, creating original sounds, um, and, and getting out of the box because so much of what I've been doing, um, is creating my own sounds in, in the box. And, um, I find that I, it, <laughs> that it, it is really difficult for me to commit to anything when I'm working, um, you know, when I'm working that way. So what I have is I have like, tons of unfinished tracks everywhere that, um, you know, eventually I go in to rework them and the software synths are outdated or something like that. And I never, you know, I never uh, striped it. So anyway, I've just been wanting to, to simplify by complicating my life with this <laughs> module. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow. It's really, you know, it's a, it's a steep learning curve, but, um, but, you know, the sound is uh, just amazing and I have no choice but to commit to it so it's that's kind of this amazing gift uh you know just, you, it's like I made a track with the sound that I and I will never get that sound back and I love it and you know it's done and I can't can't go back and forth forever trying to, trying to perfect it you know it's done so I there's something that. there's something a little cathartic about that when you know you've got this great sound yeah. and you know you get this great patch and then at the end you rip it all out and it's just like that's it's gone yeah <laughs> yeah and for me right now my curve it's like it's gone and then i'm like oh my god how, how am i gonna get it back again how <laughs> <laughs> so um, I wanted to ask you a bit about um, this dichotomy. You you perform as I am Eve, but you've also yeah. worked a lot as your own name, as Tiff, Tiff Randall. Yeah. Um, how do you decide what's going to be an I am Eve piece versus what's going to be under uh, Tiff Randall? Mm, yeah. Um, I mean, I am Eve is for for me. It is really its own its own uh, force, its own uh, channel. So. Um, 
most of the material that's that is Ionive is like very ethereal and there's a spiritual element to it that's like a lot of mysticism and you know um i love diving into things about past lives and you know the other other worldly things and um it's it's this uh i mean we all have different sides to us and that particular side of of me is the side that's like talking to the universe um and then you know with Tiff Randall, I kind of just do whatever, you know, I do whatever I feel like. If I want to do a song for my baby, I do a song for my baby. If I want to, uh, you know, do a country record, I do a country record. If I have, you know, a pop song that I need to do for some TV show, I, I do it there and I kind of, I don't really care as much about the curation, you know, it's just like, that's where the, that's where I do my work work, I guess, you know. And Got it. That's, yeah. So you you play um, well. You you compose. You produce. You're a vocalist. You have a lot of skills. Um, what's your background? What's your training? Yeah, my background uh, was uh, I started out doing classical and jazz voice, um, and then I moved to New York when I was quite young and started um, a punk band and started writing songs and um, and I just fell in love with songwriting and found this way to express myself that seemed to just start this huge healing journey for me. Um, and uh, and I just, it's been an interesting learning curve. Uh, I, I've, I've had to learn all of the instrument. I didn't grow up with this, you know, musician training as a, as a young human. So, um, my, my learning curve has been like a little at a time, just learning, you know, different instruments and, um, learning different tools and ways of, um, you know, engineering and producing all of these things, you know, I was just picking up along the way. I was, uh, uh interning at Philip Glass's studio and, uh, you know, Avatar studios and different places where I was picking up little tips and tools and, you know, uh, uh, finding my my way with it, um, and uh, yeah, it's it's been an interesting journey. <laughs> I, th I really I think the I am Eve stuff is very um, story driven. I can see that background in that sort of um, in that sort of stuff in that aspect of your music. Yeah, um, I've always um, always been very concept album focused and um i think i'm always thinking in colors and pictures and also um you know bodies of work that belong together uh, which is why i've been also so uh, uh enamored with composing and you know it's just uh, always thinking uh, about anything that i've ever recorded to as if it's a picture as if it's a movie picture. And, and, um... Very cool. Um, so you've uh, worked on TV and film and commercials. And wow. we've touched on this a little bit, but um, how does that differ from your more creative personal pursuits? Like, how does the workflow differ? I think that uh, depends on each project, really. Um, I do try. I do try for the most part, um, when it comes to songwriting, I've given up on trying to fill a description that's requested. Uh, a lot of times like the studios and the pitch agencies, they want a song that's a certain way. And I just found for me, that's just not my interest. Um, I'm, you know, I'm usually, yeah, I'm just, I'm not really into trying to sound like something else. And um, so I think I've just basically done my various things, you know, like I'll channel I Am Eve or if I'm doing, you know, more like Americana to Brandle stuff, then I'm, you know, I dive into that and I just kind of finding the words that feel right to me. Um, the sounds that feel right to me. And if there's a home for them, there's a home for them. 
Um, I have had to do, you know, certain things like the end title track for Lucy Jackson's Sea of Monsters, for example, where, you know, this was fun because, I mean, there's a story there. You know, there's a story, there were some very, very um, obvious visuals for me to play with lyrically, and it inspired me. I like the topic, you know, I love like, anything fantastical, it was just, mm -hmm. you know, fun. So, um, you know, obviously in a scenario like that, that's what you're there to do. You're there to uh, write a song, or if you're composing a piece that's supporting the story, um, and, you know, in that kind of scenario, I think it's really fun. I'm, thinking more when I answered first thinking more about TV sync sync when they're sending out like hey we need a song that sounds like blah 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 um, when it's a blank canvas like that that's that's not generally my my thing but um, but I do really love if there's a picture already in existence and there you know there's there's visuals that are inspiring uh, me while I'm while I'm working um, so, that's, that's a pretty different workflow from creatively, I'm just doing my thing. You know, whatever feels inspiring to me at the moment, you know. Um, what would you say is the biggest challenge you faced as a woman working in music? <sighs> time you have. <laughs> Every um, time I ask this to a woman, they, that's basically the response that I get. But Go ahead. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's, there's always been, I mean, th there's always the challenge I think probably of our women face, which is where, you know, people just assume um, that uh, your singer, there's always like, there's some man behind the wheels, you know, doing all the, um, and so the desire to, um, to be seen and heard with uh, you know, with with all with all that you are, without trying to be like put into a box in people's mind, I think is probably one of my um, greatest challenges. Um, and uh, I think also, you know, like I'm a I'm a new mom. I have a toddler, and so now there's like you know a lot of interesting challenges around that, the time and. Um, Time. <laughs> time and resources, time and resources. I mean, that's, that's, uh, those are, those are things that I'm definitely dealing with, but I, you know, I, I think, uh, it's probably very different. The stigmas that go around being a mom and in the industry, you know, like there's, there's so many, there's so many things. It's, I started this, uh, organization called Mamas of Music with, uh, some uh, partner in the UK, Mary Lee. And um, yeah, we've been, uh, we've just been kind of talking about all of the areas that we want to address, like the stigmas that we want to address as artists and um, how the industry does not support uh, women really. And, and then women who are moms, like, yeah. Um, what is the goal of Mamas in Music? What do you hope to achieve with it? Um, I think that a number of things, the number one thing is to really just um, be a voice for that demographic and, you know, bring um, a lot of other women in that demographic to the forefront to just talk about, you know, to talk about their challenges and the stigmas and also to, to you know, make disruption around it. I know single moms who are raising a kid and a musician, and this is, like, this is how they're like trying to keep a roof over their head. Um, and I want to make sure those people are highlighted. So I, I don't remember what the number of published uh, women in the industry and composers, but it's just, it is such a low per percentage of actually published women artists, like on women that are moms. I mean, I think just a lot of women uh, end up, you know, kind of life happens and you know it's easy to kind of fall away we'll see where it goes um i right now there's a lot of um you know amazing people that are that are uh participating coming becoming part of it who see the need for something like this to support um women and you know in uh music who have little humans um 
And uh, I think it'll be interesting to see how it unfolds, but clearly there's a need for it. There's uh, a lot of amazing talent out there. And uh, you know, I think our society and our world has to make some changes. Okay, so you said that you, everything that you played today is new. Um, yeah. So when's the, when should we be looking for that? And where? It will be, uh, so one of the tracks that I played Unnerving will be releasing either by the end of the year or the beginning of the year. So uh, you can just uh, stay posted on that, but it'll be on all of the, all of the major, everywhere, Spotify, Apple, all of the usual contenders. And um, I also did a music video for that, which is, uh, is also really lovely. I'm, I'm excited to share that. A while but that that song I'm super excited about um, I actually wrote that in, I, I wrote that as a response to all going on in our crazy world the past four years <sighs> it's been very unnerving <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and so so that one will come out first and then raindrops will come out next and uh, we'll see about this new one that I did for you guys Awesome. Um, we'll have links to all of that in the description below. So, um, you know, you can go take a look um, at the stuff that uh, she already has out as I am Eve and, you know, keep uh, an eye out for the new stuff too. Yeah. Um, so Tiff, um, thank you so much for performing for us. I know yeah, that. Thanks uh, for having me. It's, it's wonderful. It's been a crazy time and I know that it's been a lot for you to get all of this taken care of in the midst of Thanksgiving and pandemic and, yeah. and everything else that's happening right now. But yeah. um, we're so grateful to have you. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful. Thank you. you know, thanks for, for introducing me to this amazing, this amazing uh, modular synth. Like you, you guys are just brilliant. I mean, it's so, <laughs> I love, I love it. I'm in love.
So we are here with Rich and Christy from Orfix, and that was an amazing set. Uh, I was so excited when you guys agreed to do this. Um, so thank you, thank you for doing that. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, so first question, uh, everybody in the chat's gonna wanna know, can you tell us a bit about what you did? You know, how, how did you put that together? Um, so that was more or less improvised with a kind of rough discussion of what we're going to do beforehand. And, uh, well, it's, it's all set up in Christie's studio there, so I can't, I can't show you anything, but I was using a um, tr 8 drum machine and the no coast, a uh, little synth from make noise and microphone, some effects. There we sort of um, see this. There we go. Kind of. Sort of yeah. This uh, <laughs> oscillator from Leaf Audio. And uh, okay. that's about it. Run through that old shitty mixer. <laughs> <laughs> um, and for me, um, I'll just spin my computer around here. I don't know how this is going to work. OK, so since um, we're doing this from studio, I took the opportunity to use some frack gear. So I have a mix of Euro and frack. Um, and I've got an LIP in there from noise engineering. <laughs> um, very cool. Um, and um, I did use a little CD mixer. They, um, uh, you can see here, sort of, um, the, the Rodi Pola. <laughs> um and um yeah so it's, it's a, a mix of modules and um i don't know if i can talk specifically about stuff or not but um there's uh like three or four different sounds um and then i'm modulating those um individual sounds and um, doing different stuff to them while we're imp improvising yeah what what sound sources are you using um so uh, sound sources, um, I have um, like a noise um, pattern that's um, set up um, on uh, with uh, the Rubicon. Um, but what I'm doing, it's a um, uh, um, square wave and then I'm modifying that um, the through zero FM um, with um, another um, pulse wave and um, with a, um, a switch that I have doing um, a random pattern. Um, so it's, it's making um, these kind of noise hat sounds that hmm. um, you would hear that kind of um, are shifting and changing throughout. They have a, a bit of a, the timing kind of um, fits in um, because they are clocked um but um they are um moving around randomly as well too and then um because the of the modulation with the fm um it's it has a, a noise um sound to it as well too um i have a noise ring which is kind of a random sequence that is randomizing um the air verb which um does reverb um and that's randomizing the mix on the air verb so you hear the sounds kind of feedback and shift around as um as that sequence is going um but it's not yeah it's not really a sequence it's just created by those kind of random patterns oh yeah actually you know what i ended up using um noise a noise wave to modulate um uh the um, Rubicon as well. So anyway, <laughs> um, a few different things happening with that one. Um, there's another sound, which is more like um, two tones created with the Mistron. Um, the Mistron has a kind of a string sound to it. Um, and then there's just a, a really, really simple sequence on the beat step that um, is feeding into that. Um, another um, changing drone that I have on the LIP, um, and then I'm switching between sounds on that. So at some points it sounds um, uh, a little bit higher and pulsier and um, another um, 
point, it's very low um, and um, growly and drone drone sounding, um, which is like a cool part of that module because um, you can really change the sounds quite quickly on that. Um, and then um, there's another um, sort of bass pattern that comes um, from, what did I do here? Um, that one, oh, that one's from, I have a simple pattern on the Stilson hammer um, that's going into the Borg, but I have the Borg um, triggered by, um, um, let's see, what did I put it? I, I put the gates from the Stilson hammer um, into um, an envelope um, follower and it creates um, a trigger, which I then put into the Borg. So the sound hmm. that gets um, created by the Borg, um, which is uh, set at a bacterial filter is um, a very uh, quick sound as it opens up um, and it has a very particular kind of bassy kind of bookless sound to it so that's um, that's what that's doing but then I also um, have a um, another piece that I put into that to the key um, which then makes it sound a bit noisier as it moves around um, when I add that um, from the um, the roadie pola where I've got a few different types of patterns being mixed in and out. So, um, Very cool. so you are, um, you're from, are you both from the Toronto area? I know that that's where you're based now. Right? Well, ha Hamilton more specifically. So that's like, uh, like an hour South of Toronto. Um, and uh, we're, we're in the, the greater Toronto area, as we call it, the, the <laughs> sprawl around Lake Ontario. Uh, so you, is that where you both grew up? Yeah, we grew up in, like around this area. Yeah. yeah. And how and, uh, we, I always like to ask about how, um, your sense of place, I guess, um, and where you grew up influenced mm -hmm. the sort of sounds that you like to make and other influences in general too, I guess. Yeah, that's always a hard question. Um, what do you think, Kristen? <laughs> um, I'll throw it to you. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah Hamilton um, is a pretty gritty city, I guess. So maybe um, like our our time in high school, we spent kind of um, breaking into abandoned buildings and making noise um, <laughs> performances in them and you know, that maybe the city kind of lent itself to that. Um, and because it's kind of, it's a, a steel city, I guess a little similar to Pittsburgh maybe. Um, and uh, the steel in industry was on a decline. Um, so the city has been making a comeback, but for quite um, a number of years, I'd say at least 20 years, um, things were pretty, uh, um, I don't know, pretty gritty in Hamilton. And Hamilton was kind of had a reputation for being you know, a dirty city, I guess. Um, but uh, yeah, um, so that might have um, influenced um, the sound a little bit. Um, but I mean, that in conjunction with the time period which we were just starting to make music was industrial, was pretty um, uh, popular, I guess. Um, there, we were listening to Skinny Poppy and um, SPK and Dropping Gristle. Um, and you know a lot of other experimental stuff so that kind that came into the sound as well i think one of the reasons that we like your music so much is that i well first of all i grew up in cleveland ohio which is you know just mm -hmm. across the lake and uh so you know i have that same sort of mistake on the lake city uh which is the name that cleveland has always had we're, we're the city where the river caught on fire uh right <laughs> Um, and, uh, you know, we, I grew up in the same sort of gritty city listening to frontline assembly and listening to that same sort of industrial skinny puppy, yeah. all of that stuff. So, you know, listening to your stuff really, uh, Reese actually from frontline is, is who introduced me to your music. And I was, right. as soon as I started listening, I was like, yes, I get these people. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have a definite appreciation for where you're coming from. Um, 
So how did you, like, I, I'm, I don't know when you started getting into modular. Uh, how did you get into modular and how did you start working that into your workflow? Well, that's, that's a Christy question because she started in 2008, right? Is that? Yeah, 2008. Yeah. Um, well, I think in part, um, we were, I was, we were doing our shows at that time were very like computer based and really um, um, influenced a lot by like underlying um, structure. Um, and um, we had a few like com controllers that we could use. Um, and um, previous to that, like when we first started out, we had a lot of gear and a lot of chance, um, a lot more imp improvisation and uh, chance um, things that could could have that could go wrong or you know kind of spontaneously happen um, and then when we moved into this like really computer controlled um, uh, live sets I, I found it um, less satisfying uh, I think for creating and um, for performing and um, so I was kind of on the lookout for some we both were for ways to to change up how we were performing live and how we're, we were creating music too. Um, and um, I had a friend um, who um, had a, a frack rack system um, that he was wanting to sell. And um, he happened to be doing some work um, for a friend who was next to my studio. And so I got to see this uh, modular stuff that he had and um, I was just, so excited by it and um, he ended up moving to Berlin so he needed to sell this um, this um, frack system and so I just on a whim decided that I was going to <laughs> buy this frack gear and I was so happy that I did um, because then you know it it just really changed um, process and made things so much more exciting um, for me I love the idea of this random things that could happen and um and also i think i i like i'm you know a little bit more math focused and into like patterns and um uh, that sort of thing i guess and so that that way of creating the sounds appealed to me as well too i liked um i liked figuring out how they could be made or um randomized or um yeah even just the the chance things that happened with them were um, that was really um, exciting for me. So um, yeah, we um, I started with the frack stuff um, and um, and then moved into um, more of the your rack when we were traveling a bit more. We did actually travel with the frack um, a few yeah. times. We did a show I think um, in Trezor, Rich, maybe where I, I dragged <laughs> over this to Berlin like my giant frat case this was like at the point where you could still take like two 70 pound suitcases on a plane <laughs> so yeah so i had like a shop case and actually, and it was like, all frack <laughs> yeah i put it under the, the, the plane and still had a, you know could still take another suitcase full of gear and stuff yeah so um but nowadays like that's just not gonna work <laughs> pay so much money <laughs> anyway so then um yeah then um, because it was just so cumbersome, decided to move into the Euro rack. And that was, I, I think, when the Euro was becoming, starting to become popular too. Um, we did, um, we were in um, a documentary, I Dream of Wires, which uh, some uh, friends from Toronto were doing. And um, I think that kind of helped to, to um, get people excited about the Euro rack stuff too. And then that really developed a lot more. And, yeah, when I got into that. Um, but Rich also, um, at the same time, was getting into um, some of the your rock stuff as well, too. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to trying to learn trying to learn from you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's so it's so much fun to use like both in the studio and live. Like, uh, just I mean, I'm just kind of fumbling my way around with modular stuff, but uh, you know, so many happy accidents that occur, and now I'm now actually figuring out how to to build, build the ideas that I have in my head. But um, yeah, even still, you know, there's just like things that will kind of spontaneously happen. And like, you know, you try and capture that moment 
I really like that about it that, uh, you know, you, you kind of create a system, create a patch, and then you just, you just, you, you can get something happening that that's exciting and you just capture that. And I, I like that, that way of working. If it's you any consolation. Something you can't recreate. It's just that moment. I really like that. If it's any consolation, we have happy accidents ourselves. Like, wait, the module just did that? The module that we designed yeah. and made. And we're like, it yeah, did that? Yeah, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> do that too. Yeah, right. that's so cool. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's, it's one of the things that I really enjoy about modulars. Like, you know, we, were, mm -hmm. we released a module um, and as we were doing all the tests, the, it, we were um, talking on Slack with the entire team, like, it does this really cool thing, but I can't figure out how I did it, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah, don't know, you know why, so, it's just doing it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so, you know, I think even at the level of the module designers, sometimes we're, we're at a loss for how to recreate some of the really cool things mm -hmm. that, it, that they do. So, you know, it's not yeah. just you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a, this is part of the magic of it, I think. I think so. Um, I mean, and so sort of following on that is that modular is, it has a reputation for being a little bit tricky um, and finicky to use, um, particularly for live. Um, and yeah. so I, I would really love to hear how you two work with modular as a duo when you have two people um, working on independent gear, how, how are you bringing modular into a setting like that, live or in the studio? Um, do you want me to start first, Rich? Or? Yeah, sure. Um, well, we, um, one, one way we have um, uh, tried to, and, and this happened gradually, um, because we used to go back and forth during live sets, but um, we really defined what our roles are um, in a live set. Um, so that helps to make sure that we're not competing with each other. Um, and for me, when I'm creating patches that I want to be able to use live, um, I have, um, well, for one thing, I always, um, because I like to patch on the fly and have things change and um, I like to be able to manipulate things, then part of my process for playing live is um, unpatching everything and repatching it for every show so that I am always have an understanding um, of what everything is doing because I'm always um, patching that. Again, I'm, I, I know where all those cables go um, mm -hmm. because I do it so much and because that's second nature it's kind of I'm also a painter so I kind of think of it like my palette as well too so I know where to go when I want to make a certain sound I mean so I'll have um, you know particular um, outputs I have a, a quad output which is like key um, uh, my VCA matrix um, by 4MS. Anyway, that's <laughs> that's a kind of a key to the live um, show for modular stuff for me. Um, but so I have four different outputs that I know I um, are going to have a generally a particular type of sound. Um, but then within that, that I can change them up and cross them over each other and um, be able to manipulate those. But because I'm always patching everything, I think that helps me to really be able to know where things are and understand if something's not making a sound, like uh, I'm gonna be able to fix it fairly quickly um, and kind of and know how to manipulate that, I guess, um, when we're doing the live um, stuff. So it, it, there's the opportunity to be able to improvise a bit more. So I find that that um, is helpful, but, um, but then, yeah, when we're playing together, we really have like defined roles in um, a set as well too so um rich do you want to yeah i guess like um you know you're you're using the modular live um and so and i'm usually doing laptop controller drum machine maybe a monosynth or oscillator vocals so um the stuff i'm doing is sort of like the rhythmic foundation 
and then the modular Christie's Christie's doing the modular um, over top bass lines more kind of noise textures um, so that's a way that we can have a kind of mix of um, structure and chaos um, whereas I think if we both had modular systems it might be a little bit more challenging but I'm actually quite interested in trying that so um, but yeah the, the the way we've been working is 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 more or less dividing things that way oh I should say like um, we're also synced to each other so that way like um, the timing is always going to be um, right so I I take a sync from Richard's computer um, so he, that way he has control over the timing and which you know because he's doing the rhythmic um, drum most of the drum kind of portion then that you know, that makes sense um, but we're always going to be in time so that helps um, just having that like a sync together as well so yeah. imagine if we did have two systems uh, you know that would be key like for the the just the performance that we just um, did for for you guys um, like I said we have we had a sync between my system and um, the uh, no coast that Rich was using so that there's that that link happening um, and and of course too he was using the drum machine so the sync went to that as well. So. Very cool. I wanted to ask about your experiences, uh, Christy, as a woman doing industrial and noise type of music, and then just as as parents, uh, uh, being working musicians and being parents. Um, can you talk a little bit about what that's been like? Have you had any experiences that were um, that are worth worth noting um, and and sort of so do you feel like it's getting better? Uh, have we made progress? Do we where do we need to make more progress? Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, since we started making music together, I mean, I don't know that I've had um, any real struggles as a woman making um, the music that we do or or as a duo. I mean, maybe that. Um, is a bit of a difference, but um, when we first started making music, um, we actually had um, in this, uh, in, we live in Hamilton, but um, there's a suburb called Dundas um, near us, and we actually um, were really influenced by a couple of experimental um, musicians and artists um, that were doing um, performances when we were in high school and, and and just kind of discovering experimental music. And the one was uh, a woman. Um, and so, you know, I, I didn't really see that. Um, I, she was inspiring and she was making music and doing that full time and making art. And so maybe I didn't really see it as something that I couldn't do or, or something that wasn't there already. So um, I had her as a, as a starting kind of influence. And then, um, I mean, it just, in in the industrial scene there's not a lot of women but um i don't know that i ever felt you know to um i didn't feel like um discriminated against i guess um or i didn't really feel that um out of place i think this the scene we were in was really open-minded and very um like supportive in general um yeah. you know maybe in some cases like he um, people would turn to Rich about like how to set up gear, or <laughs> ask him about modular stuff or something, and he'd be like, "Oh, ask Christy." <laughs> but, uh, yeah, like I don't know that that um, you know was like a, any kind of problem for me. Um, but that said, like in the last I'd say ten years, there's a huge number, um, a lot more women um, making. Uh, this type of music and, and doing modular stuff um, and uh, more experimental or industrial based music. Um, so I think that's been really positive. And I think when you see more people out doing something like I was saying with the, the woman I looked at and I was like, Oh, I can do that. I see myself doing that because I can see her doing it. I mean, the more uh, women that uh, younger girls can see doing, you know, a variety of different types of music or, electronic um, production, that sort of thing, then they can picture themselves um, and, and they don't really see so many barriers. And so I see, I, I think there's a lot more women making this type of music. Um, 
Yeah, so something definitely I was interested in. A friend, um, Jesse Lanza and I did, um, uh, another friend, musician from Hamilton, we did a, um, a program for um, high school age girls a number of years ago. So um, just teaching them music production and sound design and that sort of thing. So uh, yeah, introducing girls to electronic music has definitely been something I was supportive of too, so. Awesome. Okay, so you guys have uh, just recently re-released your first album that you put out. It's on Hospital. It's called Fragmentation. Is that correct? Yeah, it was the first CD, so I guess the third or fourth release that we did. This is 1996 on Malignant Records, uh, the legendary industrial label from uh, the U.S. Nice. Um, so uh, Hospital has done... Um, a box set re-release of the album and then we compiled like uh, compilation tracks and live recordings from that era um, to, to put that release together so uh, yeah that came out last month cool and then you also have um, a whole bunch of new stuff coming so tell us about that uh, well we're working on two different albums right now um, one's based on a performance that we did uh when was that 2019 uh, beginning of 2019 i guess yeah uh, yeah beginning of 2019 so. yeah march yeah <laughs> at uh at the local university here they have um a center where they study um the cognition of music and sound and um they've had a series of performances so this is the second one we've done there um and they have like a um, surround sound system and it's a really beautiful theater um and we're working with, with infrasound so um Ooh. Uh, using uh these vlf very low frequency speakers that would go 20 hertz and below um so that was a lot of fun and we're trying to build an album out of this material so that will be um a fair bit more experimental than some of the more dance floor oriented stuff. Um, so that's, that's a lot of fun. So we're in the midst of working on that. And then we also have um, an album for Sonic Groove that will be more uh, dance floor ish. Um, so we have those two things on the go. The first one you mentioned, what, what will the listening experience for that one look like, sound like, whatever. <laughs> Oh, well, I guess like part of the challenge is like how to build infrasound into the recording. Yeah. Um, right. And then you would have to have the speakers capable of producing the sound. But um, yeah, we, we definitely want to have that element. Um, and uh, yeah, we were kind of like working around this theme of like uh, underworld or unconscious, like, you know, this, the, the low frequencies kind of, representing those concepts um so it's a lot of fun we did uh it was like an audio visual show that we did with uh, our friend patrick trudeau from montreal so he developed uh, uh some visuals to go with the sound and they were synced together so we also want to perform this elsewhere with him once we're able to perform again um yeah so there'll be more performances of this material but then we also want to, to create a record out of it very cool. Yeah. I think um, that's fun. It was, you know, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, oh, go ahead, Rich. I was just going to say it was an, an opportunity to, to work with material that was more listening oriented and, and less focused on, on rhythm, though there is rhythms in it. Um, so in some ways, it's kind of going back to our earlier work. Um, I think we both kind of got re-inspired by the, the box set on Hospital the fragmentation album because that material was not created with clubs in mind um, or anything really in mind. There was no kind of expectations. We were just making stuff in our basement and we would play shows to a handful of people. But um, it, was, it, was, it was a bit more open-ended than, than some of our more recent stuff. So yeah, I think that kind of re-inspired us. And I think it's like, it's really influencing all the new material. 
The only thing I was going to add is just that um, in terms of the infrasound on the recording, um, I mean, if, if you have the capabilities to hear it, that's great. But I don't know that it's, it's not, um, you'll still get the feeling for the, um, what we were trying to do without having yeah. to have that infrasound because there's also a lot of low bass sound and, sure. um, uh, you know, obviously diverse range of sounds, higher, higher register stuff that, you know, to balance whatever that we we're using to, uh, um, yeah, it's not, it's not like it's going to be silent if you don't have the... Yeah, the, yeah. So that's <laughs> where I was going with that. Um, it's not all just like low frequency pulses. Um, well, like I was saying to them, I, I, I would like to do the next time we do something there, yeah. have like a portion where it's just infrasound. Because that was like really exciting. Like, yeah, we, we started to feel like really uncomfortable. <laughs> so I was like, okay, let's do more of that. <laughs> Yeah, it's like it really it really fucks with you. Yeah, you get, you get a bit of a weird head feeling after a while, like an a dull, like at the back. It's like a whole body. Yeah, just, yeah, yeah. The whole body. But then, yeah, yeah. Once you're, yeah, in there with the speaker right in front of your face for a long time, um, yeah, it starts to get a little weird. <laughs> Did you have anybody pass out? No, we had people who said that they felt like really uncomfortable. Um, but uh, no, we didn't. I mean, the volume overall in this in this theater was relatively low compared to say like a, a club. Okay. Um, it was still a good volume, but it wasn't it wasn't a massive system. And uh, and we we had these different portions where there would be an infrasound element, like where we started the whole set with a kind of big sweep through those frequencies. But um, yeah, people definitely felt it and felt disturbed by it, but uh, no, nobody passed out. <laughs> Next time. I mean, sometimes disturbed, but also like the, the feeling of that sound like in your body is actually really, can, is kind of intense and exciting as well too. It's yeah. not just like anxiety inducing or like, you don't just feel bad listening to it, but it, like even like the more rhythmic stuff is like um, induces new, movement as well too which is what they were studying at the um, at the lab so rich yeah. to be clear i wasn't trying to set a goal for you <laughs> uh, i've already set that goal so. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you both so much um, for talking with me today, for performing for us. Um, and I'm so excited to hear the new albums when they come out. Um, everybody should go check out Orfix. Where can they find you? Mm, we have a dot com and Bandcamp and SoundCloud and all the usual stuff. And all, all of it will be down in the links uh, in the description. So, um, Everybody go check out Orfix. And once again, thank you guys so much. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, thanks for having us. And so ends another episode of the Noise Blast Hour sponsored by Noise Engineering. Want to shout out to our performers. Thank, huge thanks for uh, being with us today. Thanks to all of you for sticking with us and watching and enjoying. And those of you who hung out in the chat. Thanks for that. Um, keeping us company. If you liked what you see, uh, be sure to like and subscribe. And of course, check out the links in the description box to see to learn more about the artists. Nice last hour will be taking the rest of 2020 off. So we'll see you again in 2021.